Uh, so, yeah, my name is Paul Intelac, and I'm the co founder of Trace, uh, which is a supply chain tracking system based on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, and we're a Vermont based company. And um, yeah, so I guess I I'll, I'll wanted to start the presentation by talking about kind of the problem solving or innovation process that. I, that we took and how it differs from existing systems and talk about uh, sort of the solutions and um, that's the first half of the talk or so. And then I wanted to spend the second half of the talk um, discussing how this relates to decentralization, what that really means to me, um, both in the blockchain context and in other contexts. Uh, okay, so. Um, the first thing, uh, I wanted to just sort of lay out a framework here in terms of the innovation process uh, that we took. Um, so as a data scientist uh, and quant previously, uh, I like to think about the problem solving process as being in three parts. So first off, uh, identification of the problem. In other words, are you solving the right problem? Um, the formulation of the problem. In other words, are you looking in the right space of solutions? Um, and then finally, verifying that you know, your solution actually solves the problem intended. So I'm not gonna like, stick too closely to this framework here, but first I'll just give one example of how things have been done so far in the first generation of seed to sale tracking systems in the cannabis industry. Um, so basically the way this story goes for medical marijuana and a similar story basically for uh, recreational systems is <clears throat> the problem is Basically, the black market is a threat to uh, the legality of states. So this is all happening in the context of federal prohibition of cannabis, and one of the biggest issues with that is uh, making sure that there's no product going back and forth between the black market and the legal market. So a lot of the solutions that came from this were intended to prevent that from happening. And you know, consumer health is also important, but in some ways it's actually overshadowed by that goal. Um, so the formulation of, of the problem is, okay, uh, we can use RFID chips for every single plant, we can use uh, tags for every single product package, and we wanna track every single customer. Because of course, uh, you, know, you need to have permission to use this system as a medical patient. Um, with recreational, that last requirement maybe is gone, but they still believe strongly that we need to track every plant and product. And then the solution is, uh, let's use hardware, like RFID chips and monolithic software systems that include everything from point of sale, ERP, uh, you know, and all kinds of other things all in one monolithic system. So uh, the first way that we differ from these systems is that we are formulating the problem differently. So rather than basically responding to fear and using, uh, you know, trying to use a top-down approach to make sure nothing is flowing back and forth between the black market and legal market, we just prioritize protecting consumers. So what does that mean? It means having accurate labels. Um, and this is really important because uh, even in the systems today, labels are largely inaccurate. According to a 2019 study from Scientific American, the majority of hemp products packages have inaccurate labels on them. So the system obviously isn't helping to protect consumers. Um, so I'm uh, just gonna check my notes here. Um, well, anyways, so basically what we are trying to do is find a common goal from all of these different stakeholders, from the businesses in the supply chain, the regulators, the consumers. The one thing they all agree on is that we wanna have accurate labels. So that's you know, sort of how we're bringing these stakeholders together and trying to build trust between the government and the businesses, which will lead to better outcomes. Um, so, you know, I'm just going to quickly run through kind of how we're doing that. Uh, basically, for the businesses, we have a mobile app. This interacts with the blockchain. It allows cultivators, processors, test facilities, and distributors to enter in information about the product, uh, you know, on their device, which is, uh, it corresponds to an Ethereum wallet. It's all digitally signed, gets uploaded to the blockchain. Um, and then we also are, uh, one of our customers is the government, state agencies, like the Agency of Agriculture, they basically view the source of truth on the blockchain about organizations and lots in the supply chain, and we can do insights on that, and we can also you know, basically do boring government software stuff, but they're both our customers is the point. We're trying to service both sides, the public and private sector. Um, and finally, uh, one of the other main stakeholders is the consumer. 
they're not a customer of ours because we fundamentally believe that transparency into the chemical contents of products is a public, should be a public and permissionless resource. So these QR codes correspond to data that's just on the Ethereum blockchain, which is public and permissionless. So um, we couldn't hide this information behind a paywall or a login even if we wanted to. Um, so this kind of brings me to the problem formulation stage, uh, which is that um, if we just want to protect consumer health and we want to have accurate labels, then we don't necessarily need to track every single plant and product. Uh, first of all, um, these RFID chips actually are insecure. They can be easily hacked. You can buy uh, for $30 a, a repeater on Amazon that will scan the RFID chip and be able to repeat it and basically fake the signal. This happens all the time with farmers, not out of malice, but just out of convenience. Um, and so, but furthermore, just on a common sense level, why are we even tracking individual plants, right? Because any, any agricultural industry will take the plants and combine them into a batch. Any description of the individual plants will get replaced with an aggregate description. So it really doesn't make any sense to track individual plants. The only thing that that's good for is making sure that not a single plant is crossing that line between the black market and the legal market. Um, but again, that's not our primary goal, so let's scrap plant tracking. It's costly and overly complex. Um, similarly, we don't need to track individual product packages because uh, you know, the question of tracking a, a product and pulling for its location and custodian is kind of irrelevant to having accurate information about what's in the product. You can have lots of different products that come from a, a single batch, so what's important is having an accurate description of the batch that it came from. Um, so this is kind of what led to our overall architecture, which is at fundamentally at the lot level or the sublot level, which is essentially the least granular kind of data that we need in order to have accurate chemical information because a lot is defined the way we define it as a certain strain of hemp planted in the same general geographic location and harvested together. So you can make certain assumptions about the homogeneity of the chemical contents of the product. Um, and that's what allows you to do sampling for chemical tests and assume that that sample will be representative of the lot, right? Um, and you'll also, well, you actually can't really see it very clearly here, but in our system, basically, the tracking ends once you package all of these products up, seal them with a tamper evidence seal, and ship them off. Because again, from that point on, it's essentially logistics. The only thing that's changing for each product is the physical location and maybe the custodian, but you assume that the chemical contents are no longer changing. So that's a different problem. Um, so we really just end our, our process at the distributor. Um, and then we also have the government regulator who can see this information. It's not personal identifying information, but just stuff that's relevant for compliance or price. Um, so the goal is to have accurate chemical uh, contents labels. And uh, one way that we can frame this is as a security requirement, which is essentially that when someone gets a final product that has a certain label on it, that label is going to, be, is going to approximately match the chemical contents in the package. Um, and so you know, the way that we can do this is essentially after every stage of the production portion of the supply chain, so pre-distribution, after every material change like harvesting or extracting, you have to do a chemical test with a, with a test facility before it can move on to uh, another custodian. And specifically in hemp, you need to make sure it's less than 0.3% THC. So these are the kinds of validations we can do on the blockchain uh, transparently. Um, and that this involves also sampling procedures uh, to make sure that you're not introducing sampling bias. Um, <clears throat> and then the question of ensuring that, there, you know, that the product really is what it says it is, that does involve you know, assuming that it, there's physical security from the point of distribution to sale. So you do need to have anti-counterfeit. You do need to have anti-tampering. But that's really a separate problem that is not a complicated problem to solve uh, with software. It's really a hardware problem. Um, so we want to have chemical security. That's kind of the goal. Um, now, there's a lot of different ways that you could threaten chemical security. Um, we're going to focus for the rest of the talk on the top line here, which is insecure databases and centralized databases. But just to quickly run through some other potential issues, uh, you know, the 
it's actually true that once you package the product, the chemical contents do change slightly. Uh, for example, through a process called decarboxylation, where THCA decomposes into delta-9 THC. Actually, the regulations only comment on thresholds for delta-9, so it creates a huge loophole in the regulations. But essentially, you can normalize the data to estimate the post-decarboxylation uh, contents, and that can be done transparently. So that's really not a problem. We can, we can fix that easily. Sampling bias, um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but essentially that's a question of sampling protocols. You know, which parts of the lot are you sampling from? Which parts of the plants do you need to sample from? And how do you take the samples at the test facility and sample them multiple times and then aggregate the results, like using triplicates, for example? That's all part of the sampling protocol, which is important to define. Um, physical tampering and counterfeiting I already covered. And then there's this last piece, which is that test facilities are a point of centralization, which for now I consider an acceptable point of centralization in the supply chain. But uh, in an ideal world, we would be able to abolish the need for trusted third-party test facilities. Um, and I may have time to get into that, but I might, might not. Um, but the main thing I want to focus on is how we can decentralize a lot of the services in the hemp in infrastructure and make them more secure. And uh, so without further ado, I'll just jump into kind of the anatomy of our on-chain architecture. So the way that Trace works is basically there's an application contract, which is sort of a singleton contract that deploys organizations um, and the organization contracts. Those organization contracts are then solely controlled by the device that requested uh, to deploy the organization. Organization contracts then deploy lot contracts. So there's kind of a hierarchy. Um, but actually, that's, the organization contracts um, make that request through a lot factory contract, which is the thing that sort of ultimately makes a lot contract. The reason we went with the lot factory pattern is that it allows for upgradability of lot contracts and heterogeneity of different types of lot contracts in our ecosystem. So for example, you could have one lot contract that makes certain validations or where it actually accepts ether payments or so, you know, is a derivative or something. Um, and Finally, the lot contracts basically have a state. They, you know, they keep track of all the different states in the supply chain. They have an owner organization. They have a next permitted organiz owner organization. Um, and all of the, that state information is actually stored in IPFS uh, using basically a backwards linked um, hash chain of states that are stored in IPFS. And so we only need to store the tip of that chain on the smart contract to sort of reduce storage costs. Um, so, just a quick note here that uh, basically the whole system was designed for simplicity, not just uh, because we wanted to put it on the blockchain, on the Ethereum mainnet, uh, you know, but basically because, well, I think it, it really has uh, a lot of other benefits as well, and, and you know, reducing the storage requirements is part of that. So, okay, so, so now I wanna, bef you know, before we really dig into the decentralization, because I like to be precise with decentralization, you know, which services are we really decentralizing? What trusted third parties are we removing? And what does decentralization actually mean in this context is important to remember. So, you know, decentralization goes back to, you know, delegating control to local governments and away from the federal government. Um, that has nothing to do with blockchain. <laughs> Uh, you know, and then before that, you could argue that the scientific revolution was uh, one of the biggest forms of decentralization ever because you had an improvement in fundamental technology, the printing press, that allowed people to replicate experiments in a decentralized way and confirm new scientific knowledge. So what the case I'm trying to make here is that uh, decentralization is bigger than just blockchain, and I'll give a couple examples of this. So Trace uses blockchain and other things to decentralize some of these services. So the main things are uh, organization identity, lot identity, those correspond to the smart contracts, payment processing, this is we get basically for free by using Ethereum. Um, and then anti-tampering and anti-counterfeiting, those are physical security measures, but they are, you can actually do them in a decentralized way. So uh, first, the benefits, you know, the services that our organization contracts provide in a decentralized way, you know, authenticating updates, Access control, so showing all the devices that are allowed to update your organization's data. This is really important because you can prove that there's no backdoor to your organization's data. There's no super admin 
um, in the execution environment that could have their credentials compromised and then cause a system-wide data breach, which has actually happened many times in our industry. Um, you know, it's not necessarily the same quality software as you see in other industries. Um, and also, uh, you know, you can use Ethereum for, oh, this is ethereal there. Uh, you can use Ethereum for payment processing. That's happening within the organization contract in a decentralized way, obviously. The lot contract has various different services. I'm going to try to rush through this because I only have seven and a half minutes left. But, um, you know, the fact that you have a single source of truth for every lot state, the fact that it's strongly consistent, this is an often overlooked benefit of blockchains, is that they are a distributed database that is strongly consistent as long as you use a sufficient confirmation delay, right? So other distributed systems are oftentimes only eventually consistent. This just means that anytime there's an update, everyone who tries to view that data will immediately have the same view and it will always be consistent, which is important. Um, you know, val certain validations, like the fact that THC is below a certain percentage before it can move to the next custodian, this can be done in a decentralized way, so you don't need to trust us to implement that validation. Um, maintaining the scarcity of the lot during subdivisions, this is basically, uh, you know, when a lot gets harvested, you declare a total yield, and then you can subdivide this lot in, into sublots, and it just ensures that they add up to the right original amount, kind of like the total supply in a uh, token. Um, we don't use any token standards, but it's kind of the same concept, sort of like a non-fungible token. Um, and uh, then the other thing is basically ensuring that those QR code scans are available to everyone. So that's really a function of this lot being a smart contract on a public and permissionless blockchain. Um, so as I, as I conclude the talk, um, part, one of the themes that I wanted to, to mention here is that you know, decentralization is about more than just blockchain. And one great example of that um, that I just wanted to give you for, as food for thought is uh, tamper evidence seals. So, how, you know, you can consider tamper resistance to be a service that's in the infrastructure, and it can be provided in a centralized way with a trusted third party, namely UPS, right? You trust UPS to deliver your package without being tampered, or more precisely, that if it is tampered with, that you will be able to get a return or a refund. Um, but that is a trusted third party. But tamper evidence seals allow you to have a peer-to-peer -peer protocol between the sender and the recipient that ensures that they will know if the package was tampered with, right? So this is a decentralized protocol. It has nothing to do with blockchain. And uh, it's important to think about these kinds of things when you're trying to decentralize an industry. Um, and actually, it's kind of interesting. Tamper evidence seals can actually be thought of as a true cryptographic primitive. I recommend anyone who's kind of technical to look at this paper uh, that talks about various cool uh, cryptographic protocols that you can build using tamper evidence seals as a primitive. Um, and also, uh, I don't really have time to talk about this, but you can, you can sort of combine tamper evidence seals with uh, smart contracts to have anti fully decentralized uh, counterfeit resistance, uh, essentially by making sure you can have uh, the sender sort of make a secret commitment inside a package that will be verified only once it's opened as being authentically sent by, by the sender. And this can be done you know, just with access to a hash function, um, as opposed to some centralized anti-counterfeit authority. So these physical primitives are really important in terms of decentralizing the industry. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically it. Uh, thanks a lot for listening to me. And if you have any questions, I've got about four minutes left. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, so for the product that you're talking about for hemp, um, are you looking at applying these types of principles to, say, downstream products like, like uh, hemp seeds or hemp meal or hemp oil? Uh, so seeds would be kind of upstream. That's sort of like the very top of the supply chain. So that's something that we are looking into that will roll out probably next year. But right now, the way we do it is when you declare a lot, you declare uh, whether it's seeds or clones, and then you declare the number, and that's kind of the initial state. You declare the strain as well, um, and the location, anything you know right when you plant it, and that's sort of the initial state. Um, but we hope in the future to actually be tracking the, the seeds themselves. Um, but you know, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in the industry that we need to, to solve first. Like People are actually forging certificates of authenticity. You know, these databases are actually getting hacked, so that's kind of what we're focusing on now. 
but we would love to do that. In terms of downstream uh, stuff, we are, we are definitely looking at oil. So that would be the extractor role. W once a lot gets harvested and the total supply gets declared, you can take a sublot and hand it off to an extractor. And then they, we have tons of different extraction processes that you can select from. Um, and you can enter in you know, pre-mass extraction, post-extraction post mass, uh, things like that. And you can chain multiple extractions together. Um, so that's all valid in our state machine. So uh, yeah, we do oils, tinctures, uh, isolates, all of those things are, are part of our system. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I can't see very well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we currently aren't in, deployed in Europe yet. Right now, we're basically, we have 150 farmers, mostly in Vermont, signed up for the app, uh, and a couple other states in the East Coast. We are thinking of expanding internationally at some point. Mexico is currently finalizing the regulations for their hemp industry, and uh, there's, we're actually talking with, with some people in Mexico about that. Um, Canada, obviously, is very advanced, but the market's too saturated, so we're not going there. But uh, after Mexico, who knows? Maybe we'll go to Europe. Yeah. As a farmer, how do I sign up for your app? Like, I just get to know about you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So basically, uh, you right now what we're doing is we, we have the app on test flight. Uh, we applied for the, I, for the Apple store, uh, but they rejected it because of this one little button we had that allows people to, uh, to sell their lot on our exchange. And uh, they said we were trying to sell weed. So they rejected us, and we had to basically go back and delete the button. We're waiting to be reapproved. For now, we're, we're using TestFlight. But once, once it's in the App Store, basically, uh, you just get, you know, download the app and, and start using it. It's free to use uh, for basic supply chain stuff. The only thing we charge for is if you have some inventory and you don't have a buyer, we'll connect you with that buyer, and we basically act as a broker and take a broker fee. And that's how we plan on making our money. Um, but the basic usage of the app is free. So you can just download it and start using it. Yeah. All right. Cool. Well, unless there's any other questions, thanks a lot for being here. And, uh, oh, got one more. Oh, the company is called Trace. Uh, yeah. I, sorry, I didn't really talk too much about Trace itself. I just wanted to talk about decentralization and, and the problems in the space. But yeah, Trace, we're a Vermont-based company. Uh, we're a blockchain-based LLC, actually, the first one in, in the United States. Uh, we participated testifying on the legislation that made that a uh, real legal definition. Um, what else? Yeah, we're based in Vermont. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, our URL, uh, you could go speaktruthtoflower.com uh, or trytrace.app or tracevt.com. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks a lot. I am out of time. <laughs>